Um, Miss Dr. Francis, you're still sworn to tell the truth. I gather I'm muted. Can you hear me, Dr. Francis? No, I'm not muted. Can I? Dr. Francis, good afternoon. Uh, we'll just continue where we left off. I just have to remind you that you're sworn to tell the truth. Good afternoon. That sounds Thank fine. You. Yes, Thank you. Chief Justice. Uh, Council, Harrison. Thank you, you Madam Chair. Dr. Francis, we had been speaking about Roman numeral number six, limit, limited yes. avenues of redress for displaced landowners. Yes. And you had been going on to illustrate to us examples for that finding, conclusion of sorts that you made. Mm -hmm. Could you assist us there? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I was, um, thank you once again. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thanks, council. Um, yes, I was in document, I want to say it was TT30, Bermuda Development Company Act, and I was just making my way through some of the um, latter paragraphs of how they describe the procedure for that. Yes, um, you have, of course, they need to give written notice. They need to have the um, commissioners were being selected. Um, the commissioners, of course, being appointed by the governor. Um, as I mentioned, I think the identity of some of the commissioners um, being some individuals of considerable social and political influence in Bermuda. As a result, there is this power disparity that I think was mentioned in the previous um, bullet point that we addressed. With regards to this item that we're looking at right now, as far as limited avenues of redress, once we kind of work our way through these little jury process, and I think if we get into the higher numbers or the kind of latter portions of the act itself, items 24, where of course it mentions about giving written notice to the people whose land has been assessed by the commissioners or the, through the jury process, as well as items 26, 27, et cetera. We talk about, really, let me just settle in on um, those items 24 through 25, 26, and to, of course, 27 near the ending of the document. Because I feel for me, I was making a conclusion based on kind of looking at the holistic scope of those. By that, I mean, say this, it outlines what the procedure is for the commission. They must issue written notice. They must give um, the person kind of time to respond and produce their title, et cetera, et cetera. However, when it comes to whether it is the individual who owns the house or the individual who might be a tenant in the place as referenced in item 26 as well too, if they still have a disagreement with that price, which has come to at the end, outside of them taking up their own legal counsel to challenge that, there's no real space for this. Obviously, some might say, well, this is the purpose of compulsory acquisition. And yes, this is true. However, if someone has a dispute with the actual amount that the jurors, well, the commissioners with assistance from the jury um, come up with, there's no real space for that individual to say, well, you know, we've had this jury process and I still have an issue with the numbers that were um, determined for my property. I do not want to go forward and proceed. They are left at an impasse. Um, the only example, well, the major example that I think I spoke about when I last gave evidence was the case, of course, of Ms. Dinah Smith on behalf of her family who jointly earned a parcel of land they took up legal counsel in order to challenge this all the way to the Supreme Court. However, outside of someone having, I guess, financial means to hire a lawyer and challenge it in that manner, 
the actual act itself, when we peruse through the sections of the act, does not provide this space for individuals to say, excuse me, we've had this juror process and I'm still dissatisfied with the amount outside of the discretion of the commissioners. And that was what I was alluding to or really making reference to with this conclusion was outside of the commissioners who are given a pretty wide latitude for how they can determine what a person's um, property is worth, an individual, unless they lack, unless they have access to getting counsel, you know, paying for a lawyer to represent them in court, in a higher level court, they're really left with no other means of redress from this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Before we move on to the other area, I'd just like to take you back to an area we had previously dealt with. Mm. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 13 of your report. Mm. Page 13, the second paragraph. Page, uh, your report is exhibit two for the record. Yeah. In the second paragraph, page 13, four lines down, mm -hmm. it reads the land-based franchise law was exacerbated by the practice of white assessors undervaluing real estate owned by blacks mm -hmm. wh while overvaluing land owned by whites to further skew the number of eligible voters and our office holders. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to ask you to comment on that matter. Yeah, I'm um, glad. Thank you for raising that. It's funny. We write things and we I thought I'd written that somewhere else, quite frankly. So thank you very much for your attention, Council. Um, yes, in terms of the system of Bermuda's land-based franchise, one of the things which often gets raised is the notion, well, the land must be worth this much, or whatever the assessed value is, assessed at 60 pounds, assessed at 100 pounds, because that number fluctuated over the years. However, what we do find is the problem that oftentimes does not get as much attention is the fact that you have assessors who must make that um, determination. And this is where, again, these are some structural issues about Bermuda's politics writ large, so that when we talk about Tuckerstown, it's hard to isolate the Tuckerstown land issue without having a broader discussion about colonial governance and Bermuda's pre-existing legal and political framework. By that, I'm simply saying that this, if assessors, assessors, I have not yet to see a document that gives them very strict guidelines by which they are supposed to assess land. I don't really know if that's out there. I'm sure it may be. Well, I can't say I'm sure. It may be out there. It might not be out there. But the problem with the system that existed at the early 20th century was that assessors had a lot of leeway in terms of determining what an individual's parcel of land was worth. So that it was not simply determined by square footage, it was not simply determined by acreage, it can be determined by other influential factors such as waterfront, such as arable land or the pre presence of arable land or not. It can even simply be determined by the subjectivity of the group of assessors who are looking at an individual's land. And I get that from the political study that was done by Frank Manning. Um, I make a note of it, Bermuda Politics in Transition, Race, Movement, and Public Opinion. But it's also been critiqued and mentioned by a number of previous historians, such as um, now an ancestor, Dr. Eva Hudson, who's mentioned it in her book, uh, Second Class Citizens, First Class Men, I believe. Yeah. And... Um, as well as Walter and Braun making a reference to the kind of racial biases of um, Bermuda's politics. So this issue about assessment and the threat of assessment floats not just simply or affects not just simply Tuckerstown as a set of incidents in the early 1920s, but also is present throughout kind of Bermuda's political culture. Okay, thank you very much. Could I then take you back to the 
evidence that you had alluded to on the Roman numeral number seven, individuals mm -hmm. and groups that benefited from the land grabs? Mm -hmm. um, yes, if we look at just referencing back to the Referencing back to the report, well, it's, I believe I list, hang on, referencing back to the report, I believe I list some of the individuals who become shareholders or parts of the Board of governance, Governors, the Board, sorry, of the Mid-Ocean Company or the Bermuda Development Company and the subsequent Mid-Ocean Club that they formed. Just want to just turn to that page. Hang on. Actually, before I do that, before I do that, um, if we can roll over to page 42 of my report, page 42 of my report, if we're going to really flesh this out, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Let's look at this step by step. If we um, look at page 42 of my report, the main paragraph returning to the idea of the company's investments, right? Um, I think this is the section whereby I'm breaking down or doing a close reading of the petition that was put forward by the Bermuda Development Company. And they mentioned this fact of them supporting another tourism business. And the tourism business that I identified that they were planning to support was uh, a planned golf course project, which was, had been organized, a company which had been organized by Howard Trott, J.P. Hand, William Conyers, who was actually the lawyer for um, one of the lawyers, Watling and Conyers, for um, Furnace Biddy, as well as Gosling, Cecil Neve, and Eldon Trimingham. And they had formed the Bermuda Golf and country club uh, with the intention of constructing an 18-hole golf course. Their plans were still in flux. Their plans had not been solidified in early 19, well, in early 1920, when Furnace Riddy was making their application to acquire the land at Takastan. And there was a bit of disagreement amongst the island's elites, or just a couple of questions amongst the island's elites that, you know, okay, is this new company, this foreign company, Furnace Riddy, going to kind of squeeze out local elites who are trying to capture or monopolize the tourism business. However, what we see in front of this petition is they promise to fund some type of funding money towards or buying a certain amount of shares. I believe they put it in their proposal, page 43 of my report mentions, up to 15,000 British pounds that they had made a promise at least to contribute. And that is in found in both the, and I can pull up the document in the Dropbox if you would give me a moment. Um, that's found in the Dropbox. Give me a moment. I'm just looking it up right now. Okay, yes, it is item number TT31. TT31, petition of WJH Trutt and others for the incorporation of the Bermuda Golf and Country Club Limited, et cetera, et cetera. And on the very first page of their petition, they state that Furnace Withy and company have agreed to take shares in the said company to the amount of 15,000 British pounds, provided that the colony shall take shares to the, to the amount of at least 10,000 pounds and that shares of the amount of at least 5,000 shall be subscribed locally. So, as we can see, there is a business arrangement between the leaders of the Bermuda Golf and, Con and Country Club to get some type of matching finances. Well, as I described in the report, this does not materialize because they have some issues in getting the rest of the financing that they require. However, this same group of individuals, mostly, end up becoming the ones who would plan the Riddles Bay Golf Club. And Furnace Withy supplies them with their architect, a man by the name of Mr. Rayner, to be the architect for the Riddles Bay Golf Club. 
So in terms of a business benefit, at first we see the promise of funds, so that's a possible benefit on the way to the furnace with the incorporating the Bermuda Development Company. And then later on, we see Riddles Bay, this group of white elites who establishes the Riddles Bay Golf Course, also benefits from Furnace Withy's expertise by having this American golf designer being able to assist them in the development of their golf project in 1922 or 1923, whenever that becomes developed, goes online, which is a little step behind when, um, of course, the Bermuda Development Company gets mid-ocean or not. So when we're thinking about individuals who benefit, we need to think about individuals who are benefiting in the process of this thing coming well, when I say this thing, the Bermuda Development Company and the Mid-Ocean um, Golf Club, as well as Cottage Colony, coming into fruition. So along the process, we have those individuals. So we can talk about the Bermuda Golf and Country Club, which eventually becomes Riddles Bay. They're one of the beneficiaries, a group, as well as individuals. We can talk about Watling and Conyers, who are the legal counsel for um, Furnace Witty. And they are the ones who actually draft the petition. So you have these lawyers, one of them mentioned William Conyers, as well as Watlington, who are these lawyers who help to facilitate this. So these are individuals as well as a business who benefit as a result of the Bermuda Development Company's formation. Um, you, of course, have F. Goodwin Gosling. F. Goodwin Gosling was the former colonial secretary, and he then retires his office in order to work for the Bermuda Development Company once the Bermuda Development Company gets online and their act is passed in 1920. He becomes the secretary for the company and remains in that office for a number of years. So we have F. Goodwin Gosling. Um, I think I had that mentioned on, just give me a moment to find the page. There we go. Yeah, if we look at pages, page 53, if we look at page 53 at the bottom of that page, um, page 53 in my report, and at the bottom of the page, we will see um, Gosling to the Colonial Secretary, September 6, 1920. Um, I'll pull that document up for us in the Dropbox in a moment. Yes, here we go. Um, this is shortly after, of course, Goslin has resigned his post to become the secretary for the Bermuda Development Company. Um, he signs this document, of course, on behalf of the Bermuda Development Company. However, he then goes on to list, um, I have the honor for the information of His Excellency that the Bermuda Development Company Limited have organized in accordance with the provisions of the Act, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the following have been elected director of the company. Of course, Frederick Lewis, President Val Hackiston, Blackiston, rather, his um, American um, the American kind of division and the director of the U.S. operations, Charles McDonald, Vet Moore, of course, the architect, which was mentioned. And then we have Henry Watlington. Henry Watlington, of course, one part of the Watlington and Kanye's um, legal team, which represented Furness Whitty. We have Stanley Sperling, member of colonial parliament, supposed to be representing Takastan as part of his, you know, St. George's Parish um, political responsibility, but we also have F. Goodwin Gosling and uh, John P. Hand. So in terms of these individuals, these are specifically individuals who serve on the board, of course have perks of being members of the quite exclusive 
Mid Ocean Club once it opens, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever types of compensation that they receive from Furnace Ready, i.e., Bermuda Development Company. So, them specifically. We can also forward on to, I want to say it is page 82 of my report. <clears throat> Yes, page 82. That's page 82, excuse me. Um, in terms of, again, individuals and persons who benefit, we're just citing these as examples. What was it? No, sorry, it's not 82, excuse me. Give me a quick moment. Sorry, not 82. I saw eight and 67 and 68, 67 and 68. Sixty-seven and sixty-eight. Um, we have this reference, and this is in fact from in fact one of Mr. Blackiston's descendants had a kind of web page whereby he provided this photograph of Sound House back in the 1930s. Um, Henry Blackiston, who was in fact, as we know, one of the managers for Furnace Withy, and as we said, was on the board of directors. He actually purchased a house in Takistan and lived in Takistan at this property known as Sound House Property. And in 19... 1934. In 1934, he um, sold it because he was wrapping up his managerial operations in Bermuda, and he wanted to return back to the States, and he didn't feel it was necessary to keep the house or for whatever reasons. Um, he wanted to sell the house back. So essentially what he does is he purchases this home, and he's able to then sell it back um, in 1934. So we're looking at someone who not only is the manager in the U.S., also gets all the type of club perks for operating in this space once the Mid-Ocean um, Club uh, opens up. But then also, he ends up becoming a landowner in this territory from which Bermudians were pushed, recently pushed out for the reasons of a tourist development. And then he later on sells this property back, or rather to the company, and then the company then sells it on. Otherwise, we're not sure because I did not follow up the... Um, the kind of provenance of the house and all its multiple sales. Um, and that's also corroborated by a document, um, the Bermuda Development Company filled a number two. There was a document in there, and it gives a lengthy kind of letter between between um, Bermuda Development Company representatives, and it's signed off by Gosling in terms of this discussion about what should happen when we have these properties now and then we end up having to sell these properties back or sell them to Americans and then they return back to the ownership of the company. So these are just a few couple of specific examples of individuals in Bermuda, companies. We talk about the Bermuda Golf Company. We talk about individuals, Watley and Kanyas, um, white Bermudians who have a company who benefit from this kind of land transaction. And we talk about Mr. Blackiston in terms of an individual not only who is director of this company or a portion of this company, but also an individual who happens to own land and come to Bermuda and live in Bermuda as a kind of resident, quasi-resident tourist. The other thing we've got to think about is the ways in which this benefits white tourists who then come in and have access to this space, which once used to be homesteads, farmland, and other kind of individuals' businesses. So it does have a benefit, but we've got to understand that this benefit is not a holistic or a universal benefit. And I think that's one of the um, challenges in doing this work is the ways in which sometimes, because we understand tourism worked out or works in 2020, whatever that language may mean, depending on who is using it, sometimes it's easy for those who do not take a historical analysis point of view to just automatically assume that, okay, since it worked for tourism, it does therefore have a universal benefit. 
But one of the critical factors that we cannot escape is the fact that the Mid-Ocean Club, when it was open, was a segregated establishment. And it stands by reason that land ownership in this region was a segregated enterprise. Furthermore, it's also a class as well as a foreign kind of idea because largely these properties that accompanied or that surrounded the Mid-Ocean plot of land were also being sold to foreigners. And that was the purpose of it. It's designed to have a cottage colony, which was the language I kept coming across, a cottage colony for American investors and or tourists to purchase land in Bermuda. Um, doc, so when doc, we think so about... Hmm? Dr. Franz, could I just yeah. take your scene that you raised to page 21 of your report? Yes, sir. At page 21 of your report, the last two lines, it mm. says prospective buyers of the vacation homes mm. built on the land had to be approved by the Mid-Ocean Club's admissions committee as well yes, as sir. the governor. Mm -hmm. According to the BDC, the screening process was designed to prevent, in quote, speculators or other undesirable persons from becoming yeah. landowners in a mid-ocean cottage colony. And you have a footnote there. Can you speak to that, please? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm so glad you raised that. Um, yeah, give me a moment and I'll pull up that document. Once again, these ideas of this was not... And by this, okay, yes. I'm looking for... It's in the Dropbox for the commissioners under... TT17, 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 um, TT Mid-Ocean Club Advertising Booklet 1924. Um, once again, the construction of this resort was not this thing that would be universally accessible by all Bermudians. Obviously, by reason of the price point, not everyone could afford to move there once the place had been redeveloped as a tourism, as a tourist resort. However, even beyond simple price prohibitions which affect people of old times, we see that this was deliberately shaped as a kind of to be a class exclusive um, establishment. Just going to find the pages I quoted from in terms of this. Uh, document because the entire document is replete with these class references that indicate to the Americans who they were promoting this to as well as Canadians and others that this was to be a very class exclusive space. And I'm just going um, to ask you to if you could share your screen but specifically please tell us where that information was taken from the document you're referring to what document is that? Sorry, it is document TT-17. And what is TT-17? What exactly TT is it? TT-17 is the Mid-Ocean Club's advertising booklet. It was published in 1924. So once again, um, this is not your publication. You have drawn upon the actual publication from Mid-Ocean. Yes, it is. It okay. is the actual publication from Mid-Ocean. Okay. Really quickly, maybe this is a technical matter, Council, and maybe you could refer to the Mr. Lee or whoever is in charge. I'm trying to share my screen, and it's saying that um, host disabled attendee screen sharing. So maybe they might sure. change my administrative powers. It's give been them a attended to. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but yes, please, in this please, document, try, please try it now. Okay. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> cool. There we go. There we go. I think we're good. Can we see this? Um, TT17, Mid-Ocean Club Advertising Booklet, 1924. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, yes. Pages, what would be PDF pages, 12 out of 35 and um, 13 out of 35. Um, up until this point, this is replete with a number of these picturesque tourism advertisements, and we understand it is a brochure attempting to sell, you know, vacationing in Bermuda and the usage of the Mid Ocean Club. However, it makes a point to highlight the criterion 
for membership in the club as well as land ownership in the kind of surrounding colony. And that's what I want to focus in on. Thank you. This lower paragraph here, it states, excuse me, sorry, the privileges of the clubhouse and the park in general are limited strictly to members of the club and invited guests. Membership in the club is only upon invitation. For the present, excuse me, for the present, there is, sorry, there is no initiation fee for the present, and until May 1st, 1924, one may become a member by purchasing and holding non-interest bearing securities of the Bermuda Development Company Limited to the value of $500 and either buying and holding a home site or purchasing and holding additional non-interest bearing securities of the company to the value of $2,000. So when we even engage in thinking about this, and the page that, first and foremost, it's this initial moment where they say, well, you know, we're trying to offer a deal. However, this deal is based upon individuals purchasing stock in the Bermuda Development Company. The other my item that I think is useful is membership in the club is, upon, is, is by invitation only. And just to and give some context before you go further, Dr. Francis, this is land that had previously been expropriated and yes. then there are no stipulations for occupation or acquisition of the said land. Yes. Okay. Yes, to be clear. Um, to get even deeper with that, approximately 600 plus acres had been, had been purchased by the Bermuda Development Company, i.e. furnished with it. However, just about half of that was by compulsory acquisition, yes? Um, so just to specify if someone's saying, well, which part is and which part is not. So to that point. But with this, I think the idea about, me about membership in the club on this land is by invitation only. So in terms of sociologically, we talk about this as self-reproducing class groups or self-reproducing groups. So if there is a group that is the existing members, and we named individuals who are on the board of directors. This class of white men, elite, oftentimes of a higher socioeconomic bracket, and oftentimes politically connected in different ways, at least the Bermudian ones were, we're going to see a reproduction of that type of class of individual who becomes the new residents of this space. So one of the things that I think is ever so interesting to study about this area of the ways in which the land in Tucker's town was grabbed and then changed its hands is the ways in which we see class and we see race marking not only the acquisition of the land, but also the replacement residence. This place is repopulated. It's not just people are removed from it and it becomes a temporary dwelling space such as a hotel or a temporary activity space such as a golf course. We must remember that it is a golf course or hotel as well as a cottage colony which surrounds those um, tourist attractions. As a result, this space is repopulated, but it is repopulated according to very strict racial and class guidelines. And this is really what we're looking at. We're not just looking at club membership descriptions. So some people might unfortunately write this off or minimize what's actually being described. Here. Could you emphasize... Uh, the point, why you say it was, why would you use the word racial, racial with regards to this area in terms of the, the new paradigm shift? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you would say that it had racial connotations here? Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, we would say it has racial connotations because Mid-Ocean Club was racially segregated. Okay. They, in 1950s, when the island is going through its kind of civil rights struggles, the Mid-Ocean Club is identified as one of, the club, one of the establishments which leads itself to slowly desegregate its dining room and then, of course, later on, other services being offered. So it's a racially segregated okay. um, um, tourist attraction. So for those who might not necessarily be appreciating that or if I did not make that abundantly clear like okay. Yes. Um, yes, continue also, taking us through the document, please. Thank you. Sure. 
Also, it continues to mention, of course, the purchasing of shares is an option of how to get into this establishment. It also goes on to say that um, securities mentioned, it is probably to say the development, aha, uh -huh, right? Um, it is proper to say that this development is no real sense, a real estate promotion. And once again, they're codifying their language because when we understand class dynamics in early 19, in the early 20th century, they're making a distinction between themselves really and other tourist resorts, maybe in the U.S. and other locations, which they felt had been ruined by speculators just showing up, purchasing the land and not having such strict class guidelines for who becomes a member or who can occupy this space. So the point that they mention about this is no real estate promotion, this is not a speculative, speculative enterprise, they're really trying to highlight the fact or reassure potential white elites who may want to invest in Bermuda that, wait a second, we're going to be very strict about who we let into this space so that if you decide to invest and purchase your nice luxury cottage, you can be assured that you're not going to have some lower class or le some lesser class neighbor who's going to move in next to you and not behave according to the codes of culture and codes of social behavior that you think are fitting. So they're trying to kind of emphasize this as well as not only promote this property. Um, so kind of skate on just a little bit because I want to get to the point that I've mentioned in the document. Mm, hang on. Real quick. Here we go. Ice plan. All right. So fine, 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 fine. Sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Just as I scan through here, give me a moment. Yes, could you just take us through that document that oh, sure. appears? Sure. Sorry. I'll, I'll just go through it. Yes, I'm just right. going to cool. ask you to take us through the entire TT. One seven. One one seven. I'm just going to ask you to take us through. Okay. Good. Cool. In terms All of right. the, the, the photographs that appear, you don't have to read the entire script, but just to, by way of illustration to indicate to us what's depicted on each page. Okay. I mean, first and foremost, one of the things I like about this is we have scholars who talk about, like Krista Thompson and others, who talk about this idea of the picturesque in the colonial Caribbean as well as, you know, rural America. And what's being depicted in this image is they caption it, a bit of old Bermuda off the fourth fairway, right? So this idea that you have a homestead or what appears to be a homestead with a seascape in the background, of course, a golf green, a pristine golf green in the foreground. However, what's very interesting about there is there's no people here. Yeah, there's no people of any kind of racial background in particular, but there's no specifically no black inhabitants. However, they want to frame old Bermuda. Well, who's old Bermuda? But once again, these are ideas that were oftentimes deployed in tourism at the time in order to create a kind of image of the type of place, a serene place, a quiet place, an undisturbed place, a place free of nuisances. And we wonder why we use that word so much in Bermuda, but I ain't got time to unpack that. But this kind of tourism advertising, which is framing this, and once again, it's against the backdrop and by backdrop, I'm talking about the document itself, against a backdrop that is talking about class exclusivity. So as we slide through here, once again, the cliffs, and it's also interesting because the sea was very relevant to the former residents, as I'll probably have time to mention later on, but the sea was very relevant in terms of a number of individuals were fishermen. They kept their boats moored off these areas, however, what we're seeing in the context of tourism is a repurposing of access to the sea. Access to the sea now is an issue of beauty, picturesqueness, and possibly swimming or maybe boating. But it's not an asset, but it's not a factor that's being considered from economic livelihood and even cultural way of life. Um, as we continue through here, we talk about never in the history of developments of this kind has there been a cleaner financial setup. In this and in its general conception and execution, the mid-ocean development is largely in a class by itself. Once again, trying to hearken or herald the class exclusivity of it, right? He says, while it is certain that many of the members will want their own homes, comfortable quarters, as already indicated, have been provided in the clubhouse. 
for those who do not buy land, but desire the privilege of spending some time each year in the clubhouse. So we need to recognize that even before the hotel is built later on, the clubhouse has lodging or accommodation um, serve, um, facilities built into it. Moreover, the dining room service, et cetera, et cetera, fresh, fresh vegetables from the club's own garden. And I thought this was ever so ironic that they want to herald this notion of farm to table, you know, which is kind of coming in again, I guess, amongst exclusive eateries in the U.S. and, uh, and other places. But this idea that the vegetables are fresh from the garden, however, there's no mention of the individuals who used to actually farm those lands or the surrounding area. Um, buses of the company are available for transportation. Maid service is also furnished, et cetera, right? Two main times, it then goes on to talk about Bermuda kind of broadly. Once again, um, this notion of the picturesque, once again, removed from individuals moving through, of course, the staging of a photograph for this purposes. Um, same way is talking about, excuse me, the cottages, in addition to the American, they talk about the access of banks, doctors, <laughs> a hospital. So once again, this idea of this undisturbed, picturesque or tropical, semi-tropical um, rest or playground away from it all. However, you still have access to the things which make life comfortable, especially for folks of that class station. You are not going to have to come to Bermuda, they say, it, and be without electricity, be without your doctor, be without a dentist, be without banking services. Um, they mentioned Canadian newspapers and American and Canadian newspapers, Rob, as well as access to public libraries. Um, also, what's highlighted, and I think it's worthy of us understanding or appreciating at this time, is the laws of Bermuda forbid the use of motor vehicles. And it was even an interesting debate around the construction of this place. And there was even a debate, well, maybe they needed to bring in some cars because they have so much heavy building equipment which needed to be transported to this area. So that was a kind of political discussion which was taking place in Bermuda when the Mid-Ocean Cog was being built. However, in the early 1920s, Bermuda still did not have usage of motor cars. Motor cars had been prohibited 1908 and other, and around that time. Of course, it mentions the usage of uh, up-to-date livery, and then it gets into those who contemplate purchasing of land and building a cottage. The photographs in these pages of a few different types of Bermuda houses will be interesting. For the use of several of these photographs, the company is indebted to Mr. John Humphreys, Associate Professor of Architecture and of Harvard University, who just published, excuse me, a book entitled Bermuda Houses. So once again, I think it's interesting, just I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's interesting how the scholarship about Bermuda and Bermuda's culture is oftentimes produced as a result of the exchanges of tourism. This professor from Harvard vacations in Bermuda. Yes, he has an interest or an expertise in, in architecture. However, what gets him here in Bermuda and who does he have conversations with is the kind of white elite, and they solicit his services in the production of this furnished, well, not furnished with the Mid-Ocean Club brochure. Um, Bermuda houses are built of limestone, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the point I wanted to get at, or the point that I quoted from in terms of my report. And it states that property within the Mid-Ocean Tract will be conveyed to no one who is not a member of the club. Once again, a segregated club, whereby the members of a segregated club also have to nominate or mention or identify prospective new members. So this kind of self-reinforcing elitism and segregation. Also, by the government regulation of of any prospective landowner not a citizen of the British Empire must first be approved by the governing council. So the role of the colonial administration for Americans, well, Americans, Canadians, I think, are part of the Dominion, the broader empire, <laughs> commonwealth, right? Furthermore, all property will be conveyed subject to certain rigid restrictions. Not the least of these is the provision that plans of all improvements to be made on one's property must first be approved by the company. Once again, this idea that individuals who move there 
have a number of safeguards placed upon them to ensure that they conform to a kind of overarching standard of class propriety, as well as we've already mentioned the issue of race and socioeconomic exclusivity, which is already out there. This is a guarantee that not only the houses of a type consonant with the demands of the Bermuda landscape and of the Bermuda Ocean tract in particular will be erected on the property. In like manner, the landscaping and planting of individual lots will be subject to approval by the company. An important additional provision is that title to land or buildings may not be transferred or property leased or rented to anyone without prior approval of the company. I think this is slick. I didn't mention it in the um, document, in my report, I don't think, but I think this is also important. That's why I just had to footnote the document. This also ensures that even if there was, let's say, a more liberal-minded, fair-minded, so-called good white person, as is colloquial derived, purchased a piece of property, they could not necessarily lease it back or rent it to a former Tuckerstown resident who is black and rural and does not meet all these kind of class exclusivity markers that they previously mentioned. Just so take, once just again, take, take, the take influence us of the same small groups. Sorry? Just take us back through that point before you leave it. What you're reading so, there. Just reread it first, please. Sure. And important, and important, this is page 22 out of 35 on the Mid Ocean Club document. An important additional provision is that title to land or buildings may not be transferred or property leased or rented to anyone without prior approval of the company. So even when an individual purchases the land, and they want to then sell it again, such as in the case of Mr. Blackiston, who we mentioned was selling his property in 1934, it had to be done through the oversight of the company. And the company had to sign off on who you want to sell it to, kind of a restrictive covenant. Second of all, even if you did not want to sell it, let's say you want to lease it or rent it to someone, you had to ensure that the someone or the group of someones who you want to lease or rent to met the approval of the company. <clears throat> All of these measures essentially accomplish the same main point, and that is to maintain the class and the racial exclusivity of this zone even beyond the initial transfer of this land from Tuckerstown inhabitants to the Bermuda Development Company. And they set safeguards in place to maintain this in perpetuity for a number of years afterwards. And these structures don't just involve the company by itself, but they involve the colonial government. So it's a kind of challenging, but a very sticky means of kind of not only changing ownership of the property, but changing the racial composition of the inhabitants who would live there, as well as the socioeconomic class of the individuals who would live there, not just for one land transfer, but for subsequent land transfer. It reminds me of the language of T.M. Deal, right, where he talks about the document we looked at earlier, where Attorney General Deal mentioned that, you know, the changes in the franchise were made to prevent the sudden acquisition of political power by the newly emancipated colored folks, colored people. It operates in a similar type of way. It preserves a kind of racial difference that occurs at one historical moment, but it's a means by which we, re we repeat or ensure or maintain. Um, historians like to use the word reproduce a certain kind of social or economic phenomenon into future time or into subsequent time. Thank you. Um, again, to same page, it talks about although residents in the colony and regular use of the club are rigidly restricted to members. The privilege of staying at the clubhouse for a period of two weeks or enjoying the facilities for that length of time will be extended upon proper introduction and invitation to those who are interested in the idea. A committee of the board of directors, those individuals we mentioned earlier, has consented to act as a committee on membership and will pass upon all applications. So who do we know is on this board? We already know that Goslin we know that um, Sperling and others, you know, Lewis and Blackison and others are on this board at this time. So they are, again, active agents or active participants in this process. 
So if anyone wanted to know the names or the identities of individuals involved in this process. Um, moving right along, sorry, um, talks about the opening times of the clubhouse, talks about um, during the greater part of the season. And I think this was, again, interesting. I'm on page 23 of 35, page 23 of 35. During the greater part of the season, the Furness Bermuda line under a contract with the Bermuda government as and the official carrier of the mails operates two steamers a week from New York and return. And the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, one steamer a week. These vessels sail from New York on Wednesdays and Saturdays to Bermuda, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, I think this is useful, too, because if we remember the document we looked at previous the, from the director or furnace with Mr. or Sir Frederick Lewis to Governor Asser, where he stated that, you know, our business is the steamship business. However, the steamship business only works effectively if there are sufficient attractions in Bermuda that are developed in the ways, of course, to influence traffic. So this is an actual playing out or a manifestation of what he was describing in that letter to the governor that we looked at previously. Because it obviously advertising in the Mid-Ocean Club brochure is advertising the Furness Bermuda and naming them as, you know, the kind of premier service for the island. Talking about, again, steamers, talking about... Um, this idea of accessible without losing its distinctive charm and individuality. There is the same blending of old world and new. And one finds, of course, the same delightful climate and the old yet new loveliness of land, sky and water, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it is this natural charm in all its fullness together with all the conveniences and luxuries of life and sport that the Mid-Ocean Club colony has to offer to those of discriminating tastes who seek recreation whether in autumn or winter or spring in one of the most picturesque and fascinating spots in the world. Um, there's a bit of scholarship out there, quite a bit of scholarship, on this idea of old world charm in the early 20th century when elite white folks are deploying this idea. This idea captures not only you know, a nostalgia about how nice things were back in the day. But it's also informed by ideas about class, race, gender, you know, beliefs about where women should be in a society, beliefs about um, the proper respect which is due to older white men, as well as the proper attitudes of subservience and deference of people of color, whether that's black people, whether that's indigenous people in other parts of the world, etc. Um, one of the scholars who talks a bit about this, this kind of old world idea, is, of course, David Blight, when he talks about reconciliation literature in the U.S. South. So you find U.S. Southerners after the Civil War, war talking about, we miss the old days and the, the old world charm. And really what they're talking about is a time when whites were kind of could move through society uninhibited by these new kind of civil rights that African Americans were bestowed with immediately during the period of, of Reconstruction following the U.S. Civil War. And I mention that because the language of old world charm is being deployed here in, the 19, in 1924. And what kind of old world are they dreaming about? Well, possibly a world prior to World War I, where they thought, you know, hey, things were far more stable in terms of white dominance and this kind of colonial subservience of individuals of color or individuals in a society just writ large. So this interesting appeal to old world charm as well as the Mid-Ocean Club being marketed to those of discriminating tastes. And that's, again, their language, right? And again, if we recognize how not membership in this club operates, as we've already described. Not, not your words. Not, not you. my words, again. Okay. Not my words, right? Thank you. You know, again, we see that within the context, discriminating tastes and old world charm has some very specific, or very specific um, signal terms to the class which is being spoken to with this document, because this is not a universalist document. Um, again, just to kind of wrap, um, again, a bit of over, overview of Bermuda's history. Um, yes, let, me take, let me take you, direct, redirect your attention. Sure. I'm going to ask you to 
go to page 22 of your report. Mm -hmm. We are still on Roman numeral number seven, which deals with individuals and groups that benefited from the land grabs. Yes, sir. At page 22, you said, the immediate beneficiaries of the land grab were furnished with a steamship company whose acquisition of the land initiated the company's involvement in Bermuda tourism for the next four and a half decades, with 1966 marking the last FWC vessel sailing to Bermuda. Yeah. In addition to providing shipping services to Bermuda, FWC became involved in tourism projects such as the St. George's and Bermuda, Bermudiana hotels. Related mm -hmm. beneficiaries included a local company established by the FWC, the Merbuda Development Company, the Mid-Ocean Golf Club, the Casa Harbor Hotel, mm -hmm. and the Bermudians who played instrument, instrumental roles as the board members, legal representatives, land commissioners, and commercial agents of these companies. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment on that for me? Oh, most definitely. Oh, most definitely. When we think about, and I did not put the, <laughs> I did not put us, I did not cite a document for the fair furnace with you because that's a matter of public record. One can just simply go on Royal Gazette or any one of Bermuda's newspapers and just pull that up in 1966. That's kind of well known, or at least I thought it was well known. That's why I did not cite that at that moment. However, one of the things we've got to appreciate is to this document that we described. I'm glad we were just looking at the Mid-Ocean Company document because it does outline the relationship which was established. And this relationship was that Furness Bermuda Line ships would be the primary means by which, until, of course, the major shift with air, the popularity of air travel after World War II, Furness Ready ships were still the major way for tourists to get to Bermuda from the U.S. East Coast for a number of years. As a result, they had that trade so-called on lock. The, the St. George's Hotel was another property that they acquired, they purchased in the early 1920s. Um, I want to say it was even before Mid-Ocean was finished. Just give me a quick moment and I could probably find that in my um, sure. report because I think I might have ma made a mention of that um, St. George's Hotel um, so you can get the actual date of that. But Nonetheless, I think one of the things which is important is the ways in which these individuals have a very strong influence in Bermuda life after this moment. So again, this isn't something that occurs. And by something, I mean the acquisition of the land isn't a one and done type of transaction which does not have longer reaching consequences. So even when we think about the ways in which individuals from Pakistan and the surrounding area were or were not compensated and whether one thinks of them as fair or not. We've got to understand that the relationships and the business dealings which were set up by the individuals who actually carried this out have long-ranging lines of benefit for them and or their partner. And I think that's something that oftentimes is not always unpacked. And wherever we fall on the spectrum of what we think about it, we've got to acknowledge the long-lasting effects and benefits for the individuals who carried out the, this land acquisition, whatever we may think about it. Um, again, like we said, through earning the St. George's Hotel and then later on the Bermudiana Hotel around 1922, Excuse me, just upper my document, just digging uh, for that. And day. as you upload, forgive me for my very naive question, but the persons who benefited, what socioeconomic group were they from? Um, good question. Socioeconomic group, we would say that they would be upper socioeconomic status, um, largely white collar, whether it be merchants owning of dry goods companies such as, or, or families who have interest in the liquor business such as F. Goodwin Gosling's family with Gosling's rum as well as the importation of wine, spirits and other alcohols. Um, you have individuals, as we mentioned, like Watling and Conyers, who are involved in the legal establishment. So white collar, um, definitely um, professions. You have individuals like Sperling, whose families own businesses, as well as are in um, colonial politics. 
So when we talk about the class, we're definitely looking at an upper class. We can even make a place for the elite. When we're talking about race of these men, and like I said, it's largely men who carry this out, they're white men. You know, so it's upper class or wealthy white men, and that's just the facts of who they were. Um, individuals like Block, Arthur Block, individuals, I think he was a former um, Hamilton mayor. Um, you also have former Bank of Bermuda presidents. Uh, yeah, Bank of Bermuda presidents involved with these transactions. So definitely Bermuda's upper class, definitely not Bermuda's working class, white or otherwise. Thank you. You're searching for a document for us. Yes, yes, sorry, excuse me, excuse me. I'm looking for... I, I, I derailed you. No, that's no problem, that's no problem. <laughs> that's no problem. Um, Okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, hold on. Let's see if this. Give me a quick second. Looking up something right now. I think this is the one that mentions it. That's fine. When you locate it, you could yes. just direct us to the page. Okay, here we go. Yes, there we go. It is. TT15, 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 sorry, let me try that again, my share screen, TT15, let me get my share screen right, there we go, yes, um, this is uh, Royal Gazette, of course, from, can we all, we all can see this, yeah? Um, yes. Could you just read the headline for us? Sure. They've brought 750,000 visitors to Bermuda in 34 years. The story of Furness Bibby. Millions of pounds spent on development by Betty Smith, um, Royal Gazette, Sunday Royal Gazette reporter, the Sunday Royal Gazette, March 8, 1953. Of course, we recognize this is not <laughs> um, firstly an account necessarily of 1921 or 1922 when these land acquisitions are taking place, but this does speak to the, um, I don't remember the number of the um, bullet point that we were discussing as far as the longer term impact of this relationship with Furnace Witty and the ways in which Furnace Witty and those who worked with Furnace Witty for Furnace Witty were able to profit from this acquisition of this land at this moment. Yes, we're actually at in number seven, individuals and groups had benefited from the land grabs. So, okay, so, number uh, seven, so as you, you. So as you continue, in respect of what is your understanding based on your research, in respect of 750,000 visitors that were brought to Bermuda, what, if any, was a spin-off for the company? Not spin-off, but what is a contractual arrangement? When they brought persons here, what was the arrangement, if any, please? Oh, okay, excellent question. Um, the arrangement was largely you have um, Watland, first and foremost, Watland and Conyers, at least in the 1920s. I cannot document from the 1920s all the way to 1953 of the publication of this, but in the 1920s, even before Mid Ocean was built, Watland and Conyers were also ticketing agents for Furnace with Furnace Bermuda. <laughs> so Watlington and Conyers also serving as a legal agent for them. They also sold tickets. So any tickets that got sold or had to get dealt with in Bermuda, at least, Watlington and Conyers saw a profit from those ticket sales. So they directly linked to any type of high traffic for them was a benefit. Um, in terms of, in terms of Furnace Withy writ large or the Furnace Bermuda line writ large, they, of course, 
received from Bermuda agriculturalists priced for freight. So they had refrigerated chambers or cooling chambers in the holds of their ships where we had Bermuda onions, lettuce, other, you know, other products, celery, arrowroot, other products was shipped to the United States in furnished Bermuda line ships. And of course, they would receive some type of freight fee for the transport of Bermuda's um, um, produce, export produce. So not only is it an issue about tourists coming to and going from Bermuda, it's also a thing about Bermuda's export agriculture. So these are double ways in which <clears throat> they benefit from this. Their ownership, of course, of Mid-Ocean Club benefits them directly in terms of any profit that the club turns is something, a share of that is, of course, being enjoyed by the furnace with the company. Their ownership in the Mid-Ocean, not Mid-Ocean, in the, the St. George's Hotel, as well as the Bermudiana Hotel, of course, are separate streams of income, which eventually any profit margin lines can be directed back to the, the company. So it's like we're looking at a multiplicity of methods for this. And I think one of the reasons why I pointed to this document was on this page on, under the third um, photograph, where it says the visitors underneath that line of photographs we see. We please see, read it for us, um, please. Yeah, I'll read it for us. Yes, it says Hotel Bermudiana under construction during 1923, 1924. And the article goes on to talk about them purchasing the Bermudiana as well as um, the St. George's Hotel as well too. So in terms of the ways in which they reap a benefit from their association with, uh, not association, excuse me, reap the benefit from, sorry, I've lost my page. Give me a moment, sorry. It's fine. Technology, it's good until it don't work. <laughs> okay, sorry, there we go, back here. Yes, here we are. Um, Furnace with his confidence, I'm just reading a quick little excerpt. It says, Furnace with his confidence in Bermuda's future was again demonstrated when they became the major stockholders in the Hotel Bermudiana Company Limited, which built the Bermudiana Hotel in 1923-1924 on a garden estate in the heart of Hamilton in the center of a 14-acre park. Here again came the pre-clearing of the land and removal of cottages. Local labor was largely employed on the job again, et cetera, et cetera. And the wages of the man helped to keep Bermuda's economy stable. So, you know, again, this is this kind of very pro um, Furnace Withy and looking at the ways in which Furnace Withy has exerted this economic influence in Bermuda over a number of years. But again, the purpose of me going to this was to um, illustrate that point of number seven. And this is just one of multiplicity of documents because I think I lace these points through and some of the examples I shared earlier with Henry C. Blackiston purchasing a home yes. and then being able to sell it back in 1934, um, the various individuals who were shareholders on the board of directors for the um, Bermuda Development Company these were specific examples, but if we wanted to tease them out, I'm sure there are many more that we can look at in terms of individuals, groups, and companies, in this case, which benefit from the land removal of individuals from Tuckerton and surrounding area, the acquisition of the land, and the ways in which the acquisition of that land seems to pay dividends beyond an the actual time when the land was seized, as well as the ways in which those lands were kept within the hands of a very specific race and class group, as we mentioned with the Mid-Ocean Club and thank, the kind of cottage coloring. That's thank, thank you very much. Could I ask you to take us to new, Roman numeral number eight, individuals and groups who are disadvantaged by the land grabs? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Roman numeral number eight. Um, I want to hold on for a moment as I just scan through a couple of things we can think about is uh, 82. If we turn to page <clears throat> 
82. Thank and you. The report, I want to say it's 82, excuse me. I'm, I'm thumbing ahead in my document. Okay. Yeah. I want to just identify, yes, there we go. I think I make a mention of him, Mr. Tolbert. Okay, yes, Mr. Tolbert. Mr. Tolbert's story is recorded, or at least a portion of his story is recorded in a Gazette article, and I'm just seeking to find that right now. It's April 17, 1920. Okay. I think I have that listed as item TT, item TT59, TT59 in the Dropbox. Thank you. I want to start her. This isn't the only document I want to look at, but I want to start her because um, <clears throat> It's an interesting little snippet from Mr. Tolbert that I think is interesting and it speaks to this idea about, about individuals and groups actually is the one that empowers them to take the land, right? But um, it mentions this petition that, of course, I referenced in the document later on. But one of the things they mention is a typical case is many of the individuals are on our uh, amenable to argument is, is we may judge by the statements of a certain of others. A typical case is that of Osborne Tolbert, who is building a cottage on land belonging to his wife, one of, one of the nine children of O.C. Lambert. According to Tolbert, he has been tentatively offered 200 to 250 pounds for his place, a sum which he acknowledges is good market price, but which does not cover his own conditions. He says he is a fisherman as well as, as well as a small farmer, and the site he holds is of value to him because it gives him access to the beach. He says that if he could get in fee simple a similar property near the water, he would he could consider moving out. But he objected to be given a small holding inland abutting on another cottage, and it goes on to discover, describe the. Um, it goes on rather to describe the features and why he disagrees about it. My point isn't to get in lost in that, but it's a quote that he mentions a little further down, and I just want to kind of scroll down the page before I re-enlarge the page. So permit me if I may. Hang on. What he mentions is, and I think I have it written on the page that I um, pointed to, page 82 in the document, was how he talked about, sorry, not 82. Yes, he talks about, he wanted to say that he dislikes this idea, and I think he goes on to talk about how he wanted his sons to grow up in a different lifestyle. So one of the things we need to think about is when individuals like Tolbert are expressing disagreement with this, they're not only disagreeing about the losses of land. Because I think sometimes we get overly, well, I wouldn't say overly. I think sometimes we get stuck on that one point as if that's the only thing which is lost when individuals move. When individuals are forced to move, not by their own choice, but are compelled to move through a process like this, there's also a loss of ecosystem. And they'd set up a kind of social ecosystem as well as a way of life in this space. Um, we talk about even in 2020 in Bermuda, questions about arable land, questions about farming. Farming in Bermuda doesn't just decline by reason of all the natural, so-called natural invisible hand of economics. Farming in Bermuda also declines by reason of the extended growth of the tourist sector. And when you develop the tourist sector, certain things come at a cost of this. 
And one of the things I try and point out in the report and examples like, of course, Mr. Talbot, who is a fisherman, and if he moves, even if he feels, say, that the price that they're offering was a reasonable price, he felt that, hey, the challenge which is that I'm really facing is I have an occupation which is rooted in this land and the location of this land. And this occupation cannot be easily replaced or easily relocated. It's very much part of this kind of land holding process. And if he's compelled to move somewhere inland, that might affect his options of practicing this livelihood that he had already established. So even before we kind of, well, not even before, without simply over-focusing on land at the expense of other things, I want to introduce to our analysis this idea that individuals are losing occupation, individuals are losing cultural kind of ecosystems, individuals are losing entire kind of ways of life, and that's kind of difficult to quantify. But we do recognize that doors have a kind of cultural imprint as well as an economic imprint. He, he's a fisherman as well as a farmer. These kind of twin occupations function for him, as well as they're going to influence his family because he says he has a family. So what does that mean about the children who are being raised in his home? What do they learn? What options are they given in terms of their potential um, growth? As well as something I think that was mentioned, not I think, something that was mentioned by the commissioners last time I was giving testimony. And there was this idea that Takastan is one of these communities of black Bermudians, which largely has a level of autonomy, maybe not perfect autonomy, but a level of autonomy. And by that, I mean, these are individuals who do not necessarily have to work for someone else. Many of them are self-employed in things like farming or fishing. As a result, what does it mean then for an entire kind of generation, or at least a group out of a generation, not an entire generation, but a group out of a specific generation, to lose that capacity to be self-employed in ways that they could pass on to their children if they had held title to their land or been able to hold title to their land. So one of the things I want us to think about when we think through this is what's also being lost in it, right? Not just simply the land and whether or not it was a good price or a low price while it is relevant. There's also some other things which go with the land that sometimes are not always quantified and can't always be replaced by a parcel of money, um, a piece of money, well, <laughs> an offer of money to, in order to possibly purchase land elsewhere. So Thank that was you. one of the things I wanted to raise. Um, hang on, I think there's also another document I wanted to raise up, which was also on page, pages 86 and 87, 86 and 87. Um, maybe, can we see this? Um, I think I have it listed in the document file as T-T-O-Z, T-T-O-Z. Um, Would you like T -T us to assist you to share it or you will share it? Okay, let me see if I can share it. My, my, let me just come out of that and come back to it and see if the sharing capacity is still there. Okay, yes. It should be in the file. Can we? Yes or no? Uh, yes? We, we are seeing it. Yes, we are seeing it. Okay, good. Okay, TT0Z, um, Supreme Court petition of Donna Smith, as well as related documents. Um, when we think about individuals who are disadvantaged, we can think about obviously land loss. And while we're looking at. Could we just Donna ask Smith, you to enlarge it for us? Could you enlarge sure. it? Can we, hopefully that's clear. That's about as big as I can get it. That's um, fine, thank you. That's fine. Okay, it talks about uh, the Supreme Court of Bermuda in the matter of the estate of Josiah Smith and the Bermuda Development Company and this petition of Ms. Dinah Smith. Um, and I have within here, it's a series of papers. One, a couple of these um, I do mention, or not mention, a couple of these I display in the report. Um, Dinah Smith was a woman who lived on 
a property that had been earned by her father. He passed away and left it in his will and divided it in a variety of ways to his children. And it was, as some would say, or as members of the Bermuda Development Company would say, it was a complicated title, given all of the children a specific share of interest within the property so that it could not easily be sold off by one family member or the, or the next. However, she, um, the, she was actually the last kind of family for one of these public hearings to be held. And of course, the compulsory acquisition process went through, the jurors assessed it at a certain value, and they of course proceeded to set things in motion to acquire the land. She refused to kind of surrender her deed, and the long story of it is essentially that they issue a writ of summons against her, and they take the land forcibly after depositing some money to say, well, we've already made this decision, and we've deposited this money in the courts for you to claim at whatever time. However, we want you to surrender your deed, and she did not, and that was essentially why she is actually removed from the land by police issuing this um, summons or against her to seize the property. That's the kind of bigger story. There's some more details, but that's the broader story. Um, one of the things I kind of am just referencing this document for is, of course, just to think about the ways in which individuals, she represents individuals who are unwilling to really part with their land. However, she is someone who happens to have means to challenge this in a court of law. As I think I mentioned earlier, just because individuals move does not necessarily always mean that they agreed with the process. They just, just saw the writing on the wall. We've got to acknowledge that some of them might have seen the writing on the wall and seen, well, they have very limited opportunities or options to fight against this process. And as a result, they kind of go along with what the exit is happening rather than challenging it to the degree of taking these individuals to court. Um, we see Hang on. This, this this being described with this document, I'm trying to see if I can find my little cursor. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> In the matter of the estate of of Josiah Smith and the Bermuda Development Company, the petition of Dinah Smith of Smith Parish in the island of Bermuda, the wife of Benjamin Dickinson on the seventh day of October, 1923, Bermuda Development Company poured into this court, et cetera, et cetera, that I'm entitled to the et cetera, 600 pounds, et cetera. And this is kind of her share of the money. But I want us to be clear that we see the stamp, right? And this is in June, 1924, and it's signed by Ms. Smith. However, what's important is we recognize that I think I've put those documents into the petition. I'm pretty sure I did, pages 85 and 86. And we see essentially that she fights the Bermuda Development Company legally through the courts in 1924, 23 and 24, until, of course, she's kind of left with no other options and she loses the case and left with no other options in order to decide to just simply accept what they pay what they've um, awarded to her for her share of her family's land. My reason for raising this document once again is to illustrate the ways in which one individual at least is now pleased with this. Donna Smith is interesting as well too because she's one of the individuals who signs a petition against the Bermuda Development Company Act number two. And I know that document is entered into the Dropbox as well, too. Give me a moment to pull that as well. As, as you search for the document, I'm just going to ask you to address at the same time, well, uh, immediately after Roman numeral nine, individual and societal impacts of the land grabs, because we're, uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. So okay. I'm just going to ask you to address your mind to that after. Sure, sure. Um, Yes. Yeah. Um, TT, come, I'll circle back to that council just with this same door. TT35, um, can we all see that on the screen, maybe? maybe I'd ask you to enlarge it for us, please. Sure. Okay. Um, petition of residents of St. George's and Hamilton Parish is against the bill entitled the Bermuda Development Company Act, number 2019. The petition of the undersigned freeholders of that portion of the parish of St. George's 
<clears throat> Nuenes Takatan and the portion of Hamilton Parish adjoining their two humbly shows. And they go on to describe the ways in which this Bermuda Development Company Act is being passed through the House. They were informed that, you know, and they describe from their point of view how this land acquisition is playing out. However, they go on to say that <laughs> that although the said company proposes to use the said lands for developing the tourist and hotel business, <clears throat> there is no obligation imposed on the said company to carry out such an object. Their first notion, or one of their early notions, is to say, well, you know, this is not a necessity. So even though Furnace really has an agenda that they want to create a tourist resort, it's not <laughs> necessary for Furnace really to establish that business in the location where they live. And I think this is an interesting point because it flows in concert with something that McDonald um, referenced um, when we looked at that document. Charles B. McDonald um, talked about how they looked around the island with Sperling and with Gosling right. and others. So they have ideas of other locations on the island. However, for whatever reason, they simply they select this location. And again, the question must be asked, even if we do not have a conclusive answer to it, would they have been adamant, this adamant, to engage in these kinds of legal activities if the population who lived in this region had been white and very wealthy and elite and very well politically connected? It's a question that's worth answer, asking, even though we might not necessarily have all the means to necessarily have a conclusive answer to it. Within this um, critique of the Bermuda Development Company is embedded the similar, a similar type of thought process, and that is the thought process that if you need to build a hotel and a golf course, Mr. Withy and the others, um, it is possible for you to look elsewhere within the island. It is not necessarily that they have an obligation to carry out their objectives in the area where these individuals live. I think I've, I went to extreme uh, length in the actual report of kind of describing their critiques, so I won't necessarily go through all of those specifically. But when we look at this, I think we see this list of individuals on the who signed this document. Now, some of these individuals are related. We know that Diana Smith and Jabez Smith are brother and sister. We know that she's related to another, a number of other individuals. And I think I might mention that in the report that she's related to some of these individuals. But what's critically important is when we want to talk about individuals who are disadvantaged or displeased or otherwise put out both of real estate property, but also of potential land um, and business issues, we see Mr. Osmond Tol we see um, Osmond Talbot there as well too. And we've got to consider are all of these individuals pleased with this? And individuals might say, well, you know, it's a land acquisition, so you're going to be some unhappy campers, as some people might say. But again, we've got to rethink our frame. What about the continuity of these kinds of communities? What does it mean that many of these individuals who lived here were self-sufficient? What does it now mean that this land acquisition is now not only going to force you to relocate, but now possibly enter the wage workforce. That's an issue. Now, even with money in your hand, you purchase a new plot of land, but now you might actually have to get a mortgage to build a house on top of that land. These are other questions which need to be asked. So when we look at these names of individuals who are pushed off the land, we've also got to ask those associated questions. When you lived in Takastan, we knew full well, if you had a boat, you were able to fish. If you had a plot of land, most of the time you were able to farm it if there was arable land in that area, at least for sustenance property, self-sufficiency purposes. However, being compelled to relocate places all these additional burdens on individuals. So part of the process or the line of thinking that I go down in the report is to ask those kinds of associated questions, not simply questions to say, well, this is a land, two acres, and what's the going rate of land? Maybe, maybe not. The right. other question that accompanies that is, if this individual is compelled to move off their two acres or their 20 acres of land, if that individual was self-sufficient when they lived in Pakistan, 
how does that affect their livelihood and their subsequent pro progress through a society which we already know is racially disadvantageous to black people. And we've already talked about that at length this morning. So just take us now to the societal impacts. What, what, what are the societal oh, yeah. impacts of the land grabs? So the societal impacts, we can say, um, I don't have, I'm not sure. We can talk about the societal impacts. One of them is this kind of breakdown of an autonomous community, a largely self-sufficient self-sufficient um, community or individuals within this community are largely self-sufficient. And what does that now mean for individuals who might have been self-sufficient to be compelled to enter a kind of wage workforce and not for temporary employment in order to meet certain desires or, or material needs, but in order to maintain survival in a society now that you've been dispossessed of land which used to produce or give you most of those needs through your own labor. So that's a critical question. What does it mean to have over 100 individuals being compelled to move out of this area? And many of these individuals now shifting to, we've got to be hired laborers in a kind of economic system. That's a question that we can't necessarily easily quantify. That's a societal impact. This other societal impact, um, I know I had mentioned her in the draft um, copy of this report. I'm not sure if I have the, um, the, uh, her name in this report. I'll just be looking as I mention it. But you have a, man, a woman by the name of Mrs. Wainwright who was a young girl when she moved there, and she talks about this kind of feelings of dispossessing. And now, as a black person, unless you worked in Dakistan, it was difficult for you to even go down there and visit. That was an interesting comment that she made, right? Um, in terms of societal impacts, we can even think about, I have a section in the latter portion of the report, just want to turn to the page, where... Yes, beginning on page 83, beginning on page 83, um, I make reference to, I make reference to, uh, we're going to have letters. to wrap up in another 15 minutes. So I'm just giving you okay. the, okay. Okay. Well, in terms of societal impact, one of them is these questions of confidence in terms of governance and colonial administration. You have two letters um, that were, one letter was written to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales by a man by the name of Mr. Bourne, as well as a number of public commentaries from the Mid -Ocean, editor of the Mid-Ocean News, as well as Ms. Laura Bluck in the Royal Gazette newspaper, and those are found, the references to that are found on uh, page 81 of my report. I have the news clipping itself from the Mid-Ocean News. That was on October 23rd, 1920 that I just had the clipping that was sent to me from the um, archive. I do not have the entire page. That's fine. However, they make reference in this in terms of, <laughs> I'll just enlarge this so I can just make a quick little quote from it, right? Um, where they talk about the bill, sir, when the bill known as the Bermuda Development Company Act was before the legislature, the members of the assembly believed that the said company were willing to pay a fair price to the owners of the land. But now the bill is passed, the company are offering the owners the poultry sum of 25 pounds per acre for some of the best and most valuable in that area. So again, here they're talking about the ways in which, even though this law is passed, once it got enacted, they're saying, well, the company is not showing good faith in executing their land acquisitions. So again, when we talk about societal, broader societal -ish impacts of this, we're looking at the ways in which confidence in the government or the protections of the government do not seem to be, um, seem to be undermined by possibly the conduct of the business, meaning furnished with the uh, Bermuda Development Company, as well as the ways in which the government should be playing this kind of um, role to be responsible to the constituency, less so than others who are entering the constituency from abroad with their own kind of commercial and political objectives. So that's one of these ideas. The other thing as well, too, is to make reference to Bourne, is Bourne writes a letter to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, critiquing the deal and saying, well, you know, it's these underhanded things which are taking place. And I mentioned both Bluck 
and her letter in March 1920 to the Royal Gazette to say that their rights are being infringed upon or being lost to foreign companies, as well as Bourne making a similar critique because the landowners who I just identified in that previous document, those individuals as well make a similar con uh, similar critique, and they say that this giving of rights to a foreign company is in fact undermining the kind of political stability of Bermuda. So when we want to think about broader impacts, we can think about the ways in which this even undermines whatever little confidence there might have been in the protections of the colonial government that black people might have had. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Swan, he wrote a very interesting master's thesis, which talks about the rising of Garveyism in Bermuda post the Tucker's Town land expropriation. And I think it's very interesting when we think about the timing for that, for a, a political movement like Garveyism, <laughs> which thinks about black solidarity in the face of racism and kind of, you know, the needing for black folks to kind of rise up and stand on their feet against the depredations of racial, um, racial discrimination, et cetera. We mm -hmm. must not decontextualize that from Takasan appearance. So even when we think about the broader social, social um, impact of this, we've got to think about the ways in which even to today, there's a level of suspicion and even plain or dissatisfaction and dismissiveness about the government writ large by reason of moments like this or acts like this which undermine confidence in the government. Thank you. Right? The very last um, Roman numeral number 10, local yes. and or colonial government participation, authorization, yes. and or non-intervention in the land grabs. Can you just speak to us on that as we wrap up? Well, yeah, most definitely. Um, I know in the list of documents I have, just go back to that Dropbox, I know we include the governor's throne speech from my, um, August 1920. August 1920. I'm trying to find it. And I want to say it was in the House of well, well, I had referred to the throne speech of 2020, but I had oh. made reference to the statement by the then governor in 2014. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going back even okay. further. I'm going to 1920. Sure. I appreciate okay. it. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to find it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, yes. And one. Okay. Yes, um, sorry, just trying to pull it up now. Yes, okay, great. TT, -t, sorry, TT, -t, what is TT57? There we go, TT57. TT57, hang on, is this? It, oh no, I'm sorry, this is in fact not the governor's speech. But nonetheless, um, on the debates of the House of Assembly, I'll pull it up as, as I'm looking for it. On the debates of the House of Assembly, debates of the House of Assembly in, um, in August, I want to say it's August, excuse me, let me find the date on this page so I can let you know the accurate date for this. Okay, yes, here we go, good. All right, yes. Um, in terms of the ways in which I think I have it up here. Yes. Document is TT58. The document is TT58. TT58. I can pull it up. Give me a moment, right? Here. There we go. Should have it right now. Yes? TT58. Can we all see that? I hope we can, maybe. Yes. Could you just enlarge okay. it for us? Most definitely. 
um, track into, <clears throat> in terms of colonial complicity, this document um, is talking about a speech given by the governor in early August before the Bermuda Development Company Act Number 2 is even passed, which I think is interesting. And he talks about, um, where is it, the names, okay, midway through the page, he talks about on page 10, and 14, midway through the page, I'll try and enlarge as best I can. Um, began our steamship service, okay. Uh, it was during the following year that the first Royal Mail steamer, the Thames, commanded by Royal Navy officer, arrived at off these islands. She did not enter port, but from that date began our steamship service. Till today, we have many fine steamers, fast and comfortable, calling regularly. Furnace, Witty, and Co. will, I feel sure, be will, I feel sure, be named to be remembered by future generations when Tucker's Con will be a great center of attractions to thousands of visitors, and Hamilton and St. George's and all parts of Bermuda will be immense gainers thereby. Here he is speaking about <laughs> the ways in which Tucker's Con, the development in Tucker's Con, will be a great center of attraction to thousands of visitors, even before the legislation is passed. So when I make that statement on that page, it's indicative of the fact that this legislation was getting both privately and obviously publicly in a throne speech endorsed even before it had been formally passed into law later on in the month of August. So either he knew something that no one else knew or either he had had conversations with important stakeholders, which brings us right back to where we began our discussions earlier this morning, Council, with bullet point number one and two and the ways in which there were these interesting, undocumented, but, you know, we know about